Welcome to Second Take, the show that focuses on the issues behind the news. Value addition and manufacturing were major themes this week as the BRICS Business Council met for the first time and as specialists met on the potential to improve the interface between mining and manufacturing. Terence Creamer has been following developments and joins me now in studio. Terence, welcome to Second Take. If we can first look at the BRICS Business Council meeting of this week, um, a recommendation was made to increase the value-added trade and investment between the countries in the bloc. What is this all about? Well, I think they really realize that there's a bit of an Achilles heel in this BRICS block in the sense that you know, if you look at South Africa's trade, for instance, our value added trade really happens with the rest of Africa, with Europe and North America. It doesn't really happen within uh, the BRICS block of Brazil, India, China um, and Russia. <coughs> there we're mostly exporting raw materials unbeneficiated, mostly to China, really large volumes of raw materials. And uh, I think there's, there's a view that this is not really a sustainable uh, relationship. For one, we're quite vulnerable to you know, slowdowns in China now because our commodity producers uh, are vulnerable to the price and the demand shocks that that can bring. But also, if we're wanting to build a different type of relationship within the BRICS, which is what uh, the sort of mantra is, we're going to have to change the nature of trade and investment uh, in the BRICS block to one that um, a, a com is more accommodative of Africa exporting more processed minerals for one or manufactured products into the BRICS and not just importing high value products and exporting primary products. So the business leaders met for the first time uh, in Johannesburg this week. Uh, this is after March uh, where the BRICS summit, the heads of state met in Durban and set up this BRICS business council. It was chaired by uh, Patrice Motsepe and there were other business leaders uh, five aside, in fact, from all of the other four BRICS countries. And they met to discuss you know, how we're going to change and input into the agenda of the BRICS, um, as well as change the nature of the relationship between business and the BRICS. So it is very early days, but it was interesting to see that beneficiation and value addition was on the agenda and an acknowledgement that the current relationships are not sustainable. And later in the week, South Africans converged for a meeting to discuss the in interface between mining and manufacturing. What emerged there? Well, I think <coughs> there's, this is sort of almost deja vu all over again. You know, we're always talking about beneficiation in South Africa. We're always talking on the need to revive our manufacturing industry. It's been a discussion that's been on the agenda for many years, um, since 1994. And we really haven't cracked this code. And I think what the efforts now is to try and look at this a bit more seriously. We've got an industrial policy, we've got an industrial policy action plan, we've got a new uh, growth path, we've got a, a national development plan, all of which say that we need to rebuild our manufacturing base. And if you look at the numbers, it's, it's not very flattering for manufacturing. We've seen a massive decline in manufacturing since uh, 1994. It used to contribute over 20% to our GDP. It's now closer to 12%. So it's a, a massive relative decline. Not that output is necessarily contracted, but its relative contribution to GDP and the economy has fallen. The employment contribution has also fallen. So there's a view that this is not really sustainable, that uh, South Africa needs to reindustrialize, And we need to look at whether a country that's really commodity heavy, like South Africa, and Africa as a whole being very commodity heavy and the mix of trade at the moment being dominated by minerals whether we can't look at ways of building manufacturing uh, on this minerals platform. <coughs> now, this is not an easy thing to achieve. All over the world, countries that are uh, minerals heavy and commodity heavy generally suffer what they call Dutch the disease or the minerals curse, which often leads to deindustrialization and uh, over-dependence on one or two commodities. So there's really an interrogation of how we can do this. And one of the, the key themes in terms of the linkages is looking at the way uh, mining companies procure goods and services, and particularly manufactured goods, um, and trying to uh, really raise the game in that regard, and saying you know that you know state and enterprises uh, currently have uh, systems in place to try and increase the local content of their procurement programs, saying whether that can't be extended into the mining space. So that would be really using that base, uh, that demand stability that mining can give for manufacturers to really upscale, say, valves or other components or rubber products or wood products into that sector and then make the manufacturing industry that much more competitive 
and uh, for potentially creating an export platform into particularly the rest of Africa where these sort of products are going to be in high demand, but into the rest of the world where <coughs> there are other mining projects and uh, mining industries that will look for well-priced competitive products. So that's the one, and I think that probably is the low-hanging fruit. The more tricky issue is the whole area of beneficiation. We've been talking about that forever and ever. And it is difficult because there are constraints around uh, moving into higher levels of value addition. And if it was that easy, I think uh, we would have done it already. So it's, it's the major linkage that government uh, would like to see developed. But I think it's the really more difficult part of the equation. But none of South Africa's beneficiation aspirations can and will be realised in the absence of competitive and stable energy supplies. Do you believe that South Africa is on its way to providing more stable energy supplies? Well, we've got two massive projects, three actually, underway. Uh, that are uh, That's the Kusile, Madupi and Gule power stations. Plus we've got uh, some RPPs coming in through the Renewable Energy Programme. And we also have... Uh, plans to have other procurement plan uh, programs from the DOE to procure other private power. So I think we are coming to a point where we're starting to see that there's some uh, some traction around building new capacity that will stabilise supply in the not too distant future. But I think <coughs> there's also th we've got a whole um, fleet of coal-fired power stations that are quite mature. Some of which will have to be retired. We know about the coal cliff. Uh, which is really es Eskom's battle to supply those power stations as those tired mines start getting depleted and there's now tests on new coal coming in from the Waterberg, etc. So we have to make some decisions around the power system. As, as you rightly say, that without stable and you know, uh, consistent power and well-priced power, these beneficiation aspirations are really dead in the water. And I think people are saying that you know, there's already a lot of pent-up demand. Potentially, there would have been uh, projects that came into the mix, um, but because of the, the insecurity of power supply, these projects just haven't come to the fore. So we've just had these uh, projects being left uh, um, in, you know, file 13. So we now have to look at um, that stabilization of that energy system. There are initial, there are plans underway to to do that, but we need to make some more decisions around the longer term energy mix. And the, and the way we make that decision, I think there's also up for debate. Uh, we've got an integrated resource plan, which is out of date and it is being updated. But uh, is it dynamic enough? Is it responsive enough? Um, are we able to you know, allow the market to dictate a lot more? Or does, uh, do we have to have these very much centralized plans, which maybe you know, you're relying on people that don't have full visibility of all the innovations out there. And is there flexibility in the system to allow for innovative solutions? Do we have to have the biggest uh, coal-fired power stations, the big nuclear stations, or should we have a mix that is more determined, that's more responsive by bringing in greater levels of gas? There's, there's a lot of debates around that. But I think we need some certainty around how we're going to be proceeding in this energy space. And we need to uh, create the space for, for larger scale, well, for investment by the private sector on a larger scale, as well as for Eskom to move ahead. And we don't really have that certainty at the moment. And until we do, I think a lot of these, this uh, beneficiation, beneficiation talk is a lot of hot air because, you know, it really is uh, very energy intensive in its nature. And then you have added to the uncertainty is the whole carbon tax issue which makes a lot of these projects really un, uh, you know, uncompetitive over and above the uncertainties around um, uh, energy supply and pricing. So I think there's a, you know, there's a long way to go in sorting out the energy equation, sorting out the policy environment. And until we do, I think it's going to be an uphill battle before we can add a lot more value to our minerals ahead of export. Terence, thank you very much. That is the second take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.